Innovation drives economic growth. It's the holy grail for companies seeking to improve their financial potential. But how does innovation work and how do companies stay on top of it? Hal Gregerson, INSEAD's Professor of Innovation and Leadership, has been examining the way companies handle innovation and foster it. Hal, thank you very much for joining us at INSEAD Knowledge. Uh, in your latest study of the world's most innovative companies, you've come up with the concept of innovation capital and how important that is for keeping companies on top of the innovation stakes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Sure, Nick. It's great to be here. The, um, the list of these most innovative companies in the world, we've now done it three years, and it's a collaboration with Credit Suisse as well as Forbes around trying to put together large companies, $10 billion market cap and larger, around the world, which ones will investors pay a premium for because they fundamentally believe this company is going to be doing new things in the future, things they're not doing today. New products, new services, new geography entries, new businesses. So that's what the basis of the list is all about. And what we discovered this year as we looked at the last three years of these lists is that two companies, Amazon and Salesforce.com, basically have been in the top ten on that list all three years. We dug inside to figure out a bit of what's going on here. And here's the issue. It's a dilemma. An innovative founder starts a company, company, disrupts an industry. That's what Amazon did. That's what Salesforce did. The founder is an innovator himself or herself, if it's case, in the case of a woman. And essentially, they are great at getting phenomenal new ideas that can change and shift and shape industries. The challenge becomes, and you could call it the Steve Jobs challenge, which is what happens if and when that founder leaves? Now, in Steve Jobs' situation, it was tragic that he ended up passing away and not being there now. And they're trying to figure out how do we keep innovation alive, the disruptive type, at a company like Apple without the founder? And so what we discovered when we peeled back the layers and looked inside of Amazon and Salesforce, is that both of those founders not only sustain their own innovation capital, their ability individually to get new ideas, but they're on the hunt. They're always looking inside of their company, outside of their company, trying to identify other individuals who excel not only at getting great ideas, but ones that generate value and they actually get implemented. And if someone has done that over a long enough period of time, they've demonstrated the capacity to innovate, and therefore their innovation capital as an individual goes rockets up. And those are the kinds of people that these innovative companies with high innovation premiums, they're attractors for these people. They draw them in and they, they actively seek them out. But you also warn in your study of the danger of innovation hogging. Uh, could you tell us what you mean by that? Uh, there is a danger that the person at the top is dominating the innovation process? Oh, absolutely. So here's the, here's the it, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's a real challenge, which is a founder of a company that disrupts an industry, by definition, she or he is just incredibly innovative themselves. And the challenge becomes, will they build the next generation of other innovators around them and respect their capacity to get great new ideas as well? And here's the challenge. We've done a, an assessment of the skills required to get new ideas. Um, it's called the Innovator's DNA Assessment. It looks at your questioning skills, your observation skills, the degree to which we network well to get new ideas, how well we experiment to test and get new ideas, and our capacity to think associationally, put new things together. What we know from that data, from 360 data, is that managers consistently rate themselves about 20% higher than other people do. Which means that I've already got a bias to think that I'm better than other people actually see me as being when I'm a manager. And what we noticed in some instances when we've worked with top teams around the world is that sometimes the manager who is an innovator will not tolerate other people within their team who have equally great or even better ideas. They don't value them. And when that happens, the company may sustain itself by virtue of that strong founder over a period of time. But the point will come at which other people need to be in the innovation game. And if they're not respected and honored for their new ideas as well, that company's always sitting on the precipice and could potentially fail. 
One of the aspects of innovation that is most obvious to the outside consumer is the new products, the iPhones, the gadgets that companies are selling us. But there are other ways of innovating too, the internal management mechanisms, the relationships with clients. Are these aspects also measured in your index of most innovative companies? Those specific elements aren't measured in the innovation premium, but if a company excels at process, you know, process innovations, um, doing things better internally, it will likely show itself within the premium. So let me give you a couple of examples. Companies that, one I had never heard of before and one that we know of but learned a little more about. So the, Kiyos the um, uh, Kians Corporation in Japan, they make sensor equipment. They, they monitor factory production and assembly lines and make sure things are done just right with their sensors. Who would have guessed that they're one of the most innovative companies in the world? This is a boring B2B business. But what they excel at is they train their sales force and other folks to go into factory environments, understand what's going on, really know the customer's needs, go back to the technicians at Kian's Corporation, develop a solution that's just perfect, and the customers are absolutely delighted and they repeat. And so that's a situation where they've used these skills to master access to factory environments in order to deliver solutions that are perfect. Rakuten in Japan also, one of the, one of the high companies on the list, um, they basically try to become more innovative, and this is unusual for Japan, they've decided everybody, both within Japan and outside of Japan, everyone who works with Rakuten is going to learn English. Which, that's a big investment. This is not a simple thing to do, but what they're trying to do, it's not just English that is the difference here. It's that the, those folks learning a second language learn another perspective on the world. And a colleague here, William Maddox and his colleague at Northwestern, Adam Galinsky, have done some cool research on basically people who can take different perspectives are more capable of getting novel new ideas. And this is what's going on at Rakuten. They're learning a different language, culture, perspective that enables them to get new ideas, not just the top, but throughout the entire organization. And so looking ahead, uh, a company that wants to get into this list or wants to stay, is in, it, in the list and wants to stay, what specific recommendations would you make to such a firm? Number one, start at the top. This requires a deep a deep analytical look inside of ourselves as senior leaders. And as we work with teams around the world, it's basically, do we have enough people at the top of our company who they themselves have high innovation capital? They go out, they get new ideas by doing these five skills. And what we know from the data is that these disruptive innovators, they spend twice as much time on a week-to-week -week basis than non-innovative CEOs. And what that translates into is four months out of the year for a highly disruptive innovator versus two months out of the year for a CEO who does get some ideas but they're not as powerful or impactful. You know, four to two, four to two months. And that double amount over the course of a lifetime adds up to something. So you look at Steve Jobs, his 56 years. You look at a Jeff Bezos. You look at, Nick, you look at these people who are now in their 40s and 50s and they've started disruptive companies. They've spent 18 years of their waking life actively trying to get new ideas. So that's number one, do we do it at the top? Number two is, do we have the belief that anyone in our company can get great new ideas? And do we have a, an approach, a system, a management way of responding that tells anybody in the system, great idea, let's figure out how to make it happen. And it's that last part where most companies, well, both parts companies stumble, but the last part is a big stumble. So Jeff Bezos told us when we were interviewing two times now, basically, it's here's what he said, is my job at Amazon is to reduce the cost of experimentation so that thousands, not hundreds of experiments happen. That is, an, that is not how most managers think. They're trying to, you know, hedge their bets and protect their, in, their, you know, the things that are going on, keep it safe. But Bezos and Amazon is like, no, let's figure out fast, quick, cheap ways to just try things. Try it, try it, try it. And your job if you're a manager in that kind of a company is to enable others to not only get new ideas, but try them. And when that happens in an organization, 
their premium goes up. We, it, it will. Good things happen. An inspirational endeavor to look forward to. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Knowledge Thank you. Great to be here.